Our next speaker is Anna Marie Pyle, and she's going to tell us a story, her story, about how thinking outside the box created another groundbreaking scientific discovery that helped us figure out how we work and will help to keep us well. Um, thanks, Larry, for another great uh, meeting here and a chance to come sort of home to Boulder. Um, I did my postdoc with Tom Check and knew Larry when I was just fresh out of grad school. So it's, it's just always so great to come back and, and feel like you're part of this community. Uh, my talk is about the biggest switch in gears that we're going to see at this meeting. Uh, so before I make that massive gear shift, um, I want to say that the, the words of the last speaker were about the sanest description of how we should be handling diet that I've ever heard. And it's exactly how I live my life. And I have a PhD, and it, you know, he's brilliant. And so thank you very much for, for what you had to say. <laughs> and I'll also say that that is what my mother taught me, and how she taught me to cook, and how I teach my kids to cook, and garden, and, and you know, it's all part of passing it down, too. Anyway, that was great. And um, so, so Again, I'm, I'm actually trying to reset my brain here after that. Um, what I want to talk to you about today, um, I'm going to be telling you about a story that grows out of my own research and my own realization that in understanding the molecular structures of some important human proteins, we might think of some new ways to handle infectious disease, certain kinds of infectious disease especially. So um, what we'll be talking about is how um, if we rethink how to sort of strengthen the defenses that are already inbuilt within us, we may be able to handle uh, some of these bad guys that I'm showing you here. So we're going to start our story by talking about how people like me typically develop drugs. And I'm part of the process uh, that uh, would generate something like this. So uh, this is a newly released drug that is a cure, a true cure, for hepatitis C virus. This is a revolution in medicine, and it is an amazing thing. This is a cure for one virus, OK? And that's very, very important to realize. It's a major accomplishment, because it works on multiple genotypes of the virus, and those, virus, those genotypes are quite different. Um, but the thing to know about this drug, this cure for hep C, is it took 10 years to develop, about $2 billion, and if you want to take it and be cured by it, it's going to cost you $84,000. OK, so I'm not saying that's not important. I really believe this was a major advance. And given that 2% of our population in the United States has this virus, and the health consequences of having the virus lead to very expensive other downstream healthcare problems, this is a huge accomplishment. But what, and, and then I'll show you next, so that you understand my approach, sort of how people come up with innovations like this. And it comes from knowing molecular structures. This um, is a picture of the molecule that is sort of attacked by the chemical in that bottle. And this is the chemical structure of the drug. It's a prodrug um, that actually mimics one of the nucleotides in, in uh, the recipient's body. And so what happens is that chemists like me we, uh, we, when we understand the molecular structure of a disease protein, in this case, this is the polymerase, or sort of copying protein for the virus, what we do is we design small chemicals that'll fit up inside there and gum up the works. And that's how inhibitors work. And so for us to develop good drugs for a um, particular condition, we need to know this. We need to know the molecular structure. And even before we can get here, we have to know a lot about the virus. We have to really study the thing to death. Um, it has to have been around for a long time. And we have to have an army of people, an army of thought, to get to this point where we can get to here. OK? So what I want to talk about today is that most of the time, we're not going to have this much time. And we're not going to have these kinds of resources. Um, and I'll give you the next example. A very closely related virus to hep C is one that you're going to start hearing more and more and more about, and it's dengue virus. Um, it's actually really similar. The drug you just saw isn't going to work against this, because each drug we design for one virus 
is very, very specific for that disease. This is a map showing um, the distribution of dengue virus last year. Um, if you look at the map from 2008, this line was right around here. Now dengue is creeping into Texas and Florida. It's, it's uh, throughout Puerto Rico. And I think it's very important. It's, it's very common now in Mexico. And for those of you who don't realize it, Mexico might as well be one of our states. Our, our economy is interdigitated with Mexico. And so dengue virus really matters. And we really don't know how we're going to handle this. We haven't had time to deal with it. We probably will come up with a sort of strategy for this. But even so, this gives you an idea that just when we think we've fixed a big problem, there's another one coming down the pike. There's more to come. These are just the ones we know that are an airplane ride away, or depending on global warming or some circumstance, could rapidly become our problem. And we're not going to have 10 years, we may not even have $2 billion, to come up with a magic bullet to fix it. Okay? And so this is the problem that interests me right now. And the fact that um, maybe these strategies that we're, that we're using are kind of inadequate for every application. But again, you know, the fact that people have come up with great drugs for things like HIV and HCV are wonderful accomplishments, and we need those too. But we need some other thinking as well. An important case study that you all are familiar with is the Ebola outbreak. And it has served as sort of a crucible for helping us see what occurs when the fire of a, of a new virus ravages through large communities. Um, we've lost our fear of viruses. We've lost our fear of what happens. And in the news, through the pictures we see, we're, coming to, we're becoming more cognizant of what can happen. This is a picture of this very interesting looking virus on the surface of a cell. This is from uh, the NIH uh, archives. And, um, this is what it looks like, but what does it look like when it's unleashed on a community? Um, in a community that's uh, attacked by a really terrible pandemic like this, whole communities fall apart. Um, massive numbers of people get sick. Uh, there's, there's chaotic distribution of quarantines. There is, um, there's unspeakable suffering, but there's also just incredible social disruption. There's war. There's all kinds of just terrible downstream consequences of this. And um, so one of the reasons is that when something that we don't understand, some virus we don't know how to combat, sweeps through, we just, we just don't have any mechanism for dealing with it other than this. You know, just good protection physically to prevent yourself as a caregiver from being infected. Um, this is a picture of some British volunteers um, helping to care for the chronically sick uh, Ebola victims. Um, and you can see, you know, the defensive gear that they're wearing to minimize their own risk. Um, here's another picture of a, of, a, of a worker who is training other people on how to best apply their protective equipment to um, sort of help them go and do the good work they need to do, which um, there is some palliative care that you can do for Ebola. But there's also just caring for the displaced people. You don't know if they're infected. And you, know, you have large groups of people who have to protect themselves like this. And then this picture, to me anyway, sort of sums it all up. And um, when I look at this picture, I think to myself, how do we best prepare the world's most vulnerable people? This little guy here represents, to me, the world's most vulnerable people. He's incredibly poor. He's malnourished. He doesn't have access to a blog. You know, he, he is completely vulnerable. And he's in the care of somebody who just through their love and passion, even knowing the risk to themselves, has gone into this zone to take care of this little boy. And that's the, that is our situation. And I ask myself, what can we do when this kind of thing happens? And a question that's really interesting to me, as you'll see through the science we're doing, what can I do for this guy, actually? I'm fascinated by him. This is the person who knows exactly what the risks are um, and has actually knowingly walked into this situation to care for people who can't help themselves. I really, I'm amazed by people like this. And I think there are mechanisms for protecting them so that they can better serve. So pictures, the only sort of downstream or downside that I feel when I look at these pictures is 
they look like someplace else. This happens someplace else, far away in the developing world. This, this doesn't happen in places like the United States. Well, that is not true. Um, there's great historical precedent for this happening in the United States. Um, one of the classic examples is Philadelphia in 1793. Um, a virus very closely related to hepatitis C virus called yellow fever virus swept through Philadelphia right after the country was so fragilely formed and killed 10% of the population, displaced the other half as refugees, and Philadelphia basically emptied. This could have changed our whole history had it happened a few years earlier when we were trying to win a revolutionary war. This was a very, very disruptive thing. And this guy, Benjamin Rush, who you may remember from American history, was one of the only doctors that stayed around to help the sick. And he's very famous for that. So again, I'm fascinated by people like him and the person on the last photograph who willingly, they know what's, what's going on, and they go in to help other people. And so, so the thing that is fascinating to me is, can we get people like that, or people in the wake of a terrible pandemic, better protection? Is there viral protection? In the, in the absence of any prior knowledge of the molecular mechanism of a particular virus. So basically what I'm saying is, in my view, we need a new approach to antivirals. We, the approach we have and, and that is common in our very um, fortunate first world environment is a good one, but it can't be the only one. This is our present strategy for dealing with, um, with drugs against pathogens, antivirals, antibacterials. They're usually one bug, one drug strategies. And as I've said, they're very expensive, extremely time consuming to execute. And so what I think is we need to think differently about this. We need to stop focusing all the time exclusively on the bug or the virus, shall we say, and learning every little nitty gritty part of it. Instead, we need to look, uh, look inward, look at ourselves. We need to look at the human organism. This is a human. This, this is actually my human. This is my daughter. <laughs> and um, Ellie is a very standard issue human. And as a standard issue human, the thing I'd like to tell you about Ellie is that she comes fully equipped with an amazing arsenal of defensive proteins inside her cells that help her defend against the pathogens that swirl in the world around her. And all of you have them. And um, not only that, but Ellie here is a member of a species that evolved in a sea of terrible pathogens. Our species has always been confronted by all kinds of terrible pathogenic fungi, pathogenic bacteria, viruses. They have shaped us. We have shaped them. We're all part of a community of organisms. But as a result, inside our cells are proteins and mechanisms that help us to respond to the world around us. But it's really ironic to me that people like me who've spent so many years studying the molecular mechanism of all these germs and how they replicate and everything, and we know every atom of a lot of their proteins, we don't know much about these defensive proteins in Ellie and the rest of us that help us to help ourselves. We know something about what these proteins are, and that's through pioneering work by my Yale colleagues, Charles Janeway and Ruslan Medzitov. And that's because in the early 90s, ah, sorry, uh, Charles, who has since passed away, who was a brilliant man, he had this interesting idea. He said, okay, so when a pathogen gets inside your cells, when you get infected by a virus, for example, he believed that in fact, your ability to make antibodies against that pathogen and respond to it wasn't very efficient. And he said there had to be a middleman, a set of molecules in your cells that acted as surveillance proteins that figured out early on that the cell was under attack and that that process then was linked to the ability to make antibodies and then fight off the virus or whatever it is. This was just a concept. This was just like one of Charles' Imaginings, And then he got this brilliant grad student, Ruslan. And um, Ruslan found the first one. 
and it was called toll-like receptor 3, and he named it a pattern recognition receptor. And um, your cells have many of these in them. Uh, we have lots of these different kinds of biosensors, and these are proteins, and I'll show you a picture of one of them in a minute. I saw you, uh, showed you a picture of a hepatitis C replicative protein. They're about the same size as that. You know, they're the same sort of spaghetti that I showed you before. But what's interesting about our pattern recognition receptors is that they are nanomechanical devices. They are proteins that are also nanomachines. They bind uh, other molecules, and they have motion, and they have responses to small uh, uh, molecules that they also bind. So as it turns out, inside some of your sub uh, cell subtypes, you are expressing a menagerie of these different pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs. You have custom-made PRRs for all kinds of little calling cards that pathogens inject into your cells when they infect you. You have a PRR for different kinds of sugars that, for example, a fungus, when it's infected, has deposited. You have a PRR for certain kinds of proteins that are typical of a uh, bacterium, but not that are in your own cells. And most importantly for this talk, you have a pattern recognition receptor set that are specifically designed only to recognize the kind of RNA molecules that are put there by a virus. And um, so why are these important? These guys are your first line of defense. They, uh, they basically bind to and detect pathogen molecules and switch on your immune system. And your immune system does not switch on very well unless these guys have been switched on too. So let me give you an example of the one that I study. OK, so how do your cells respond to a viral infection? And I'll show you which viruses I'm talking about in a second. So imagine this is a virus, and it's uh, outside the cell. Uh, certain kinds of RNA viruses um, contain in the center an RNA molecule that gets injected into the cytoplasm of your cell. And it has certain uh, doodads on it that are very specific only for viral RNA. And we won't go into the molecular nature of those. And then floating around in your cytoplasm are your pattern recognition receptors. And in this case, this is a cartoon of one called uh, Rig I, which is the one that I study. And until it's bound to its, uh, its target, it's kind of um, floppy. It's prowling around in the cytoplasm, inactive, and very kind of quiet. But when it recognizes a viral RNA, it binds it very tightly. It actually wraps around it really tightly like an octopus, and then kicks out a couple of little appendages that initiate something called a signaling cascade that then leads ultimately to a strong immune response and cellular and, and, and uh, systemic response to this infection. Okay, so that's basically sort of a rough outline of how it works. And I should say that if this step is bypassed, your, your adaptive immune system will not generate a good robust response to infection, which is in fact one of the ways Ebola is so nasty. Okay, so I set out to understand the molecular mechanism of the Rig I sensor. Rig I is an important protein because it plays a central role in innate immunity and inflammation. So it's important in a couple of different ways. It's an essential component of your immune system, as I just showed you. When it is functioning improperly, it is implicated in certain kinds of autoimmunity. And it has emerging roles in development and differentiation. And there's a lot of links with certain types of cancers. So it's very interesting to understand it better. Um, but really, it is one of your most important endogenous biosensors. And it detects RNA viruses of highest public health significance. These include the flaviviruses, such as dengue, West Nile, yellow fever, the hepatitis C viruses, influenza, Ebola, and related emerging viruses. Now, one of the things I should say at the outset is that we have very little understanding of the molecular structure of any of the pattern recognition receptors. So we know all kinds of viral proteins, but we don't know what our own look like, our own defensive proteins. So I set out to change that. I wanted to look at the Rig I biosensor. I wanted to see it at the molecular level so I could understand it and maybe manipulate it. 
Um, and I'll tell you, you know, full disclosure, I didn't set out to do this because I wanted to solve the problems of pandemics. Um, I'm a very geeky person. Um, I'm an RNA biologist. I'm trained by Tom. Um, I just love how molecules recognize other molecules. And I'd studied the, the uh, sort of translocation, movement, and structures of nanomachines for a long time. And I thought this was an interesting one. So I set out to study it. Knowing what to do with it came later. Now, one of the things that hasn't happened that much in the um, symposium is for you to see sort of what happens in the lab. And I think it's good for you to know what scientists do. To visualize what this biosensor that's so important looks like, the first thing we had to do was to make lots and lots of it. And we can do that uh, through recombinant DNA technology. We actually uh, uh, sort of um, uh, co-opt a bacterium's own systems for making proteins. And we can use them as tiny factories to make lots and lots of protein. And in this way, we made milligrams of this protein that I'm interested in. And then we grew crystals of it. And you can see this is a, this is a microscope, and there's a computer screen for it, showing you the crystals of rigai. You may not realize you can grow crystals of a protein just like you can grow crystals of sugar or anything else. And when you do that, it's remarkably powerful because then you can take that crystal, you can put it in an x-ray beam, and it'll diffract the x-rays in a pattern, and you can collect that pattern. And with a whole lot of math that there's no way we're going to discuss right now, you can use that to deduce the three-dimensional structure of the molecule. Okay? So this took several years. Uh, so full disclosure, this is not fast, right? And so what I'm next going to do is show you the structure of rig I. And what you're going to see is the structure of rig I caught in the act of binding a viral RNA. And to me, this is just like proud mama speaking here, I think it's a beautiful protein. I'm, just, I'm not showing you any of the domains of it yet. I'm just showing you how it has lots of parts, and it surrounds the viral RNA molecule, kind of like a donut. So now we're looking down the RNA axis, and you can see rig I surrounds it. It just grabs it and hugs it, OK? And in that way, it forms all these interactions with the viral RNA so that it knows it's found its target, and it's able to differentiate that RNA from the RNA inside your cells. That's very important. You don't want it binding your own RNA, or it's going to make you pretty sick. Okay? So in any case, once we had that structure, we could begin to understand how to make it function a little better or a little worse. Okay? And, um, but before I talk to you about that and get into that, um, what I'd like to do is actually just in um, sort of the spirit of geekiness, um, I'm going to show you the parts list of this protein, because it's, it's really beautiful to me anyway. Um, now I'm showing you how the rig I protein and the RNA that it's binding is sort of made up of different modules that have different sections. So rig I is what's called a multi-domain protein. It's almost like different globular domains of protein that are strung together. Okay? It has two parts, this HEL1 and HEL2. Those stand for helicase domains. Um, and this is a, this is a color-coded sort of uh, diagram of the domain architecture. These are found in many, many molecular machines in your body. So you may not realize this, but your body is just full of machines, um, little mechanical proteins that carry stuff around and that pull apart DNA and RNA. Your proteins are often not like these static things that don't move. Many of them are very dynamical. And so this kind of domain here is like the molecular Lego that is really crucial for building mechanical devices in the cell. So rig I has two of those. But what's really amazing, and which we'd never seen because nobody had ever crystallized a relative of this protein, is that it has evolved all these innovations that enable it to specifically bind viral RNA. And one of them has sprouted out of this mechanical domain, this HEL2I domain. And you can see it here. This guy, as you can see from this picture, now imparts the ability to recognize RNA double strands. Proteins in this family had never been observed to do this before. And this is what enables rig I to specifically recognize, for example, influenza RNA instead of human RNA. It also has sprouted this C-terminal domain here and perched it at the end of the viral RNA. And this enables it to recognize 
the molecular signature of many viral RNAs, which in the spirit of geekiness is a triphosphate, okay? So um, it specifically binds up there. My favorite part of this protein, however, is this set of red uh, alpha helices that's called the pincer domain. This is a completely new innovation that's never been seen before in, in a nanomechanical device. And what's fun about it is that it links the region of the protein that's important for viral RNA binding with the part that helps the protein actually move and respond mechanically. And it has been called a molecular camshaft because just like uh, something that's rotating around a central axle, it can actually transduce energy and information through the molecule. So it actually, this is a true machine. It's a lot like looking into one of those old clocks from the 19th century or something like that. So anyway, we've spent a lot of time studying how this protein works and what it looks like. And I'm going to skip all of that because I've dragged you through enough of it already. And I'm going to tell you a little bit in cartoon form how rig eye works. Um, in its uh, silent form, when it's prowling around in your cytoplasm, it has this very open structure. But then it's triggered by the binding of a viral RNA. And I'll show you in a moment that this little snippet of RNA here that I'm showing you is a proxy for viral RNA. When it does that, it winds up tight around this RNA core. And we've also learned, and we're not going to talk about it today, that it's a two-trigger motor. It also binds adenosine triphosphate in the middle. And when it does that, it's like a spring. It springs open two other domains that turn on the activation of your immune system and turn on the induction of an important uh, signaling protein called interferon. OK, so that's how rig eye works. And knowing that, we set out to um, see if we could actually put rig eye into action. Can we design molecules to kickstart the immune system by building on what we know about the rig eye structure? I mean, that's what people have been doing with these viral RNAs. They've been saying, OK, if we know the molecular structure, we'll, bind, we'll find little molecules that bind and, and mess them up as inhibitors or, or make them more active as um, agonists. So what we did is we took the rig eye protein, and using some of the techniques I've shown you and many others, we determined um, the strongest RNA ligand for the human rig eye protein. In other words, what is the RNA molecule that will turn it on immediately and most quickly? And we changed the RNA length, the composition, everything else. And we found that this little hairpin RNA with a triphosphate and this little um, loop region here is exceptionally good at turning on your immune system and turning on the protein in the lab. We didn't know it was good for turning on the mammalian immune system until later in the talk, but let's say that in the lab we saw that we could turn it on most quickly with this. And since most of you um, don't get anything out of looking at letters and dashes and everything, I wanted to show you a space filling model of what this little piece of RNA would look like if you actually were bumping into it as a protein prowling around in the cell. It would look like this, OK? So to the rig eye innate immune receptor, this is like candy, OK? It's its favorite thing. <laughs> and when it gets it, it just goes nuts. And you get lots and lots of signaling, as I'll show you in a moment. And you get very rapid activation of the innate immune system. And what I'm going to try to do is just show you and I'll probably do a really bad job, um, how we know that it affects the innate immune function. One of the ways we know is by studying the function of rig eye in living cells. And what we like to do is work with kidney cells, um, HEC 293T cells, for those of you who uh, are used to this sort of thing. We put the cells on, on agar plates, make the cells happy, and then we actually introduce um, circular DNAs of three flavors into these cells. One of the circular DNAs, um, called a plasmid, encodes a reporter for whether or not the rig eye protein has been turned on. And um, so you let that percolate, and the cells grow happily. And then we know that rig eye will not be turned on until it's given the viral RNA. Now, the, the um, gene that gets turned on, when it does so, it glows bright yellow. This is called a reporter gene. Okay? And so 
What I'm showing you here in a cartoon is now you take this plate of happy cells, you challenge it with an RNA molecule, and the individual uh, cells that are responding will give you a yellow luminescence. So in this sort of silly cartoon, what I'm showing you is that if you don't add RNA, you don't see any luminescence. If you add the typical RNA that people challenge with in this assay, you, don't, you see a small response. If you give it the Ferro Rocher here, um, you get a huge response in cells. And this is actual real data comparing um, the uh, little hairpin RNA with other RNAs that people have tried before. Okay, so all of this stuff, this is long published, and you know, I think it's very true to say that immunology can't be done in cell culture. Uh, immunology is a systems biology thing. It only is meaningful in the concept of a whole organism. And so you can't really get to the bottom of it unless you're studying it in animals. Okay, so I was confronted with something that for me as a chemist was quite daunting. I had to get this guy into this guy. <laughs> and, you know, I have never dealt with fuzzy animals other than the ones that live in my house as my pets. And um, so I knew that we had to understand how mice would respond to this RNA. And so I enlisted the help of my immunology colleagues, um, especially Akiko Iwasaki, who is also my colleague at Yale. And what we found is that you can simply administer this um, RNA in, uh, by IV into a mouse and monitor how well it's turning on the endogenous um, innate immune system through the rig eye receptor. Now, um, initially I had torn out all the data for this talk, but I decided it's, it's fine to show a little data because actually the effect is pretty clear. And I'm just gonna show you as a result what we saw when we take actually a very small amount of that RNA and inject it. What you see is that um, if you have an RNA that looks a lot like this, but it's missing this little doodad here at the five prime end, you don't get any um, beta interferon. I forgot to put something on the y-axis here. See, that makes me kind of a bad scientist, actually. I didn't label my axes. <laughs> anyway, um, you need interferons as part of the signal for engaging your adaptive immune response. And so if you add RNAs that don't stimulate the rig eye protein, you see no response. If you add a, a sort of bulk RNA that is typically used to stimulate the innate immune response, you get a small response. But if you give it this molecule, which is really like its favorite molecular candy, even in a mouse, you get the biggest interferon induction that's ever been reported. And so this means this mouse is now on high alert he is going to be ready for anything that hits him in terms of um, uh, a, a, a novel pathogen and his ability to develop antibodies against it. So basically, now what we've done with this knowledge up to this point is we've now um, been exploring how much is the special RNA that we've developed and that's based strictly on the molecular pictures we got through crystallography, does this really do what we think? Does it really elicit a very, very specific immune response? The reason that's important is that people for a long time have known that if you just take bulk RNA and you inject it into cells or people, um, you can get viral protection, but it also makes you really sick. Um, it makes you very sick because it unleashes all kinds of inflammatory things that are undesirable. And that's because you've got all kinds of different RNAs in there. So what we've done very recently, actually in the last couple of weeks, is we've um, done the transcriptome analysis of uh, mice that have been injected with this versus other types of RNAs. And we've seen indeed that this molecule, when you give it a really well-defined single uh, RNA, you do get a very, very specific type of immune response that is um, not going to be linked to some big cytokine storm that's going to make you sick. That being the case, the question is, does this kind of thing constitute the ability to design some new types of therapeutics in which we engage our own equipment rather than constantly attacking the pathogen? So the outlook on this is, can we use these as sort of small molecule activators that protect against viral infection? So the next set of experiments that we're doing, this is a work in progress. I don't, I don't know the answers here. 
Um, will these small molecule activators then protect the mice against flu, herpes simplex, and other viruses? And those experiments are going on now in the lab. Um, so far, it's looking actually quite good. Um, and so this means that, should this be true, this kind of approach might lay the groundwork for certain types of therapeutic boosters that you can give to people, and this gets back to the guy in all the plastic, or even people in the, in, in, um, that are threatened by a pandemic, some way to boost their system so that they're sort of prepared, and while they might still get sick from a virus, they're gonna have much less drastic response than they would in a completely naive state. So that's one thing. Can we design uh, viral protection through the um, sort of jump-starting of the innate immune system? Can we treat acute infections? There are various reasons to think that something like this would actually even help make you better once you're infected, and we're doing those experiments now. Um, chronic lung disease also has deviations in rig eye expression that are potentially impacted by something like this. Can you use something like this as a vaccine adjuvant? You may realize vaccines both have an antibody against something um, that you are being vaccinated against, but it also has stuff in it to tickle your innate immune system. Would this be better? Because it's much more specific. We don't know. Um, and secondly, the lab is working hard on small molecule modulators of this, more drug-like little molecules like that one in the bottle that I showed you before. Now that we've developed all these assays for turning up or down the human innate immune system based on rig I, uh, we can do all this high throughput screening, which we heard about earlier today, and we found molecules that accomplish many of these things as well. But the good thing is, if it works, and it's a big if, you're hearing like the early part of the story here, um, if this works, it would work in the wake of many different types of viruses. It wouldn't be any longer one of those sort of one bug, one drug solutions. It's just a way to strengthen your armor. And so in closing, what I'd like to ask is, can we do better than this? By looking inside, by looking inside us, taking a closer look at our own molecular biology, just and looking at it as closely as we've looked at all of these viruses themselves and come up with some sort of new strategies for combating things when, um, when diseases come at us too fast to, to uh, study them in the detail we've done traditionally. And so that's my question, and that's sort of my progress report. And um, I'd like to thank all the great people who worked on this project. Da Hai Lu was the pioneering crystallographer who solved the early structures. Um, this collection of individuals did beautiful uh, biochemistry and cell biology to uh, lay out the pathway. Megan Fitzgerald contributed to that as well. And these individuals um, sort of got our program to the next level by getting us um, into mice so that we could understand how molecules like this function in a whole animal. And we're indebted to um, these people for helping us uh, have the resources uh, to do our science and also um, the national labs that would enable us to do the experiments. And if you're curious about all the different things we do, go to my website where we outline everything there because we do other kinds of work as well. Anyway, um, I welcome your comments and thank you for listening. Thank you for that tantalizing talk. Um, I just want to announce before we take questions that we're going, we're running a little behind. We're going to shorten the break and recommence at four o'clock. So you should have time to take a bio break and get refreshment if you want. But let's go ahead and ask questions. Given the, the uh, talks on tumor vaccination, is there enough known about this system to think that the two approaches, uh, PD-1 and this, could be synergistic? Do you think that already or I not? I think they're definitely likely to be synergistic. And there are people thinking about this, combining this kind of thing with uh, the tumor, tumor immunotherapy. Um, one thing I didn't talk about is that um, we are now packaging these into uh, polymer nanoparticles so that they can be delivered more specifically. And some of our collaborators are using them um, for certain types of um, uh, pediatric cancer uh, explorations. And, and there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of interest in the cancer community also in this kind of technology. So 
very interesting talk. Now, uh, there's another family of antiviral innate immunity, toll-like receptors, and so it's always interesting in biology if you've got different ways of doing things. Uh, so um, are you going to explore how to also upregulate that? And because probably if we've got two families, uh, activating both might be a better way of uh, dealing with the problem. It's completely true. Um, and uh, one of the people who's made me think most deeply about this is Steve Reed, who's a typical uh, part of this conference, who's usually here. And he works on TLR4. And, um, and uh, uh, one of the members of IDRI, which is his institute, who I actually had lunch with, was saying, wouldn't it be great to combine the TLR4 agonists with this kind of thing, and then you could get a response that was, was really, really uh, powerful, but, but uh, less likely to be toxic than other things, because they really involve very discrete molecular uh, stimuli of the innate system. So I think combinations of these are, are a good way to go. As, as for my lab, um, there are a couple more that we might want to go after. Um, but I'm still interested in doing my best I can with Rig I because the more we find out about this one, this one is really very much a sort of master regulator. So if you can get Rig I to be modulated, uh, you've, you've come a long way as opposed to trying to modulate all of them. Does infection with one virus protect against another? Often does. For, Often a, does. for a lot of these, for a lot is of these. Is it specific reasons. for RNA and then another RNA, or is it RNA or DNA? The thing is, though, um, you know, the, these different. It sort of depends on what type of virus you're talking about, um, and uh, different viruses, you know, put different kinds of uh, payloads in in human cells. So. Um, I think yours is an interesting question. If it was a similar type of viral strategy, would one confer protection on the other? I don't know enough to really answer that with precision. And, and, but all I'm saying is it would depend on which type of companion virus is. It's interesting, though, because people are often co-infected with more than one, right? And so, so it's an interesting point. It's a very interesting point. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm understanding this correctly, but um, how long does their immune response remain elevated? Right. Um, and do you have to be infected during that elevated response to develop antibodies for it mm -hmm. or not? I, I almost feel like you, I, I didn't plant that question, but I wish I had. That's a great question. OK, so, so what I like about this approach is that you wouldn't want to be taking these stimuli all the time, because you'd, you'd have this sort of systemic inflammatory response that wouldn't be healthy. Um, so no, what's great about any kind of short-term thing like this is that you would, um, you, would, you would have this interferon response that was pretty well regulated short-term um, that would then lead to crosstalk with your adaptive immune system, but it would be temporary, right? Just when you need it, when you're working in the camp or whatever it is that you need to do. And then you go home and you get off of it. It would be the concept. So, so then the other question is, um... Is this in combination with direct exposure to a pathogen uh, a, a cure to prevent infection from that pathogen, potentially? It's been uh, not this RNA, but other types of nucleic acids that have been used in viral protection experiments can be, but I don't know that this one is, completely protective, yes. But we haven't done that yet. We're, we're, on, we're working on that. And like I said, uh, the, the viruses we're testing right now are um, uh, herpes simplex virus and, uh, and flu, which are the classic models for protection. But what I'd love to do, and, and, I, and I don't have the collaboration set up, is to go down to like Frederick and do it with Ebola. Because Ebola is really, should be a perfect example and, and a perfect uh, uh, system for the, for the rig eye um, approach. <laughs>